Hello and welcome to Ableton on Air Live. Um, we're here uh, and Fly on the Wall Productions, and uh, we are waiting for uh, we're waiting for Ann Watson, our guest, Senator Ann Watson. Uh, we are waiting for her. Uh, she's also a teacher and uh, senator of uh, Washington County. Uh, speaking about Washington County, last week we had Washington County Mental Health. Heather Slayton uh, was is part of that organization, and we um, we spoke to her about uh, we were live, and we spoke to her about Washington County Mental Health Services. And uh, but today we are talking to Senator Ann Watson um, about. Um, about the recent school shootings uh, that have been happening, uh, one in Baltimore last week and one in uh, uh, and one in one in um, uh, uh, one in Georgia. So um, we are. Uh, uh, we are waiting for Senator Ann Watson. But in the meantime, let me bring everybody up to date on what is going on with um, the uh, school shootings in, um, in Georgia and uh, Baltimore. And also there was a shooting in Kentucky. Um, according to... Uh, according to GMA, according to GMA, good morning, America, uh, jo the Georgia school shooting suspect uh, and father made a courtroom appearance. A grand jury, a grand jury will uh, hear the case next month. Uh, in district, according to the district attorney, and more charges will be added. Uh, for the accused shooter. Now, who in the heck buys their son or buys their kid a uh, a uh, assault rifle, an AR assault rifle for Christmas last year? That is the biggest question on people's minds. It's going to get worse before it gets better. One of my um, pet uh, uh, one of my pet peeves, one of my pet peeves, yeah, see, uh, but one of my pet peeves, um, that I have as far as advocacy, um, that, um, that no one should be buying their kid a, an assault rifle. There are problems with security in schools. Um, there needs to be more uh, police presence in schools. There needs to be more, uh, you know, there needs to be more accountability in schools. If um, if there is uh, no accountability, and by the way, teachers should not have guns or should not arm themselves when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to guns uh, and firearms. President Obama in 2015 dealt with a situation um, besides um, his administration. He created a, a mental health kind of law with Social Security. If you get your Social Security check, uh, if you get your Social Security check, uh, for mental health reasons, you should not have a gun. So they need to, or they already have, I think, in place where where um, you have to wait about five, uh, maybe sometimes a couple of weeks before you get a firearm. That's another reason why I won't have the NRA on my shelf. Um, 
that I won't have them associated with um, Ableton on Air or Ableton on Air Live. Um, you know, if if someone now the only thing I agree with is if someone needs a uh, rifle to go shoot um, an animal for food, if you have no way of getting to a supermarket, then uh, we should um, have, uh, have, you know, have stipulations with that where people can um, go uh, deal with um, the food issue. If you cannot get to a supermarket to even buy uh, meat, you should be able to just own a firearm for that. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a little bit, um, uh, it's a little bit um, inhumane that way, but, um, uh, you know, we should be able to just um, have one for food, not to kill people, not to maim people. Um, you know, the firearm issues are... Um, are you know really really bad with that um and um any, anyway um and watson is on her way uh but um please by all means please like and subscribe on facebook aired out and please go to www.airedoutvt.com that's airedoutvt.com and uh, in the interim, um, I encourage you to please, please, uh, please go to orcamedia.net. That's www.orcamedia.net. And please look up Able Den on Air. Um, as a matter of fact, um, while Ann Watson gets here, I would like to uh, inform people tomorrow is the anniversary of 9-11. And... Um, Back in 2018, I uh, covered uh, with Washington County Mental Health, uh, a, we did a 9-11 special, an anniversary special. And tomorrow is a, a 34, 35 years of um, the, um, the, uh, the 9-11 uh, terrorist attack. Uh, actually, 2001, I'm sorry, 23, 24 years. Um, uh, that's my fault. Please excuse me. Uh, is the 9/11 um, anniversary, and um, please uh, go to uh, orcamedia.net and please look at the Able Den on Air uh, anniversary special that we did in 2018 with Washington County Mental Health, and uh, we talked about trauma and uh, how to deal with trauma. This whole thing is traumatizing. When it comes to guns or um, anything of that nature, and um, we should, there should be more staffing with mental health programs. There should be more, uh, more of everything. I understand everything comes down to money. Sometimes it's politics, but um, we really need to get more staff when it comes to. Our guest just arrived. <laughs> And how are you doing? No, that, that can't, that can't. Sorry. Um, sorry. <laughs> Just point the mic. Okay. Yeah. Like there this? There we go. Yes. Okay. Um, a little bit closer. Okay. Yes. And um, we would like to welcome Ann Watson to the studio. <laughs> and um, how was your day in school today? It was great. It was a good day. It was flannel day. <laughs> so, uh, you know. Yeah, well, I... I did have a, see. I have a flannel tie. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I great. did have a flannel shirt on. Nice. <laughs> um, but uh, flannel day. So tell us about that. I mean, you're a school teacher. You have been a school teacher for many, many years. Yes. Um, besides being a senator, um, which do you? I, I understand. You have two jobs. You you wear many, many, many <laughs> hats. Which do you like better, though? Oh, gosh. You can't have a favorite hat. I mean, I <laughs> love all of them for different reasons. Um, I mean, uh, right now, like being a, a science and math teacher, I just love... Oh, 
<laughs> gotta have the bell. We gotta have the bell. There you go. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Ding. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I love there. There's like just really lovely moments with students where you could watch the light bulb go off, and they're like, "Oh, I get it," and that is uh, so delightful. It's so fun mm -hmm. um, to help students learn about the world, and and I think um, uh, I think even learning. You, you could think of learning as like. Um, answering questions and having less wonder about the world. But I think the more that we learn about the world, um, if we maintain uh, like a, a stance of curiosity, that the more you learn, the more it opens up the world to even more wonder. And uh, so increasing the amount of like um, awe that people have for the natural world, uh, for the universe, I think is, um, is a good thing. And, um, one of the things that drives science and helps make us human to be able to find patterns in nature. Um, and that's, it's a, a delightful, um, activity in that way. So I love to share that. I love to share the, um, the elegance and mystery and, um, sometimes logicalness and sometimes illogicalness. <laughs> Those are probably not words of, um, of the universe. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's very fun. So, okay. So, um, we're going to basically, uh, we're talking about the biggest uh, thing that yeah, last week was very bad. Okay. Yeah. There yes, are, it was. Uh, two school shootings and then also a shooting in Kentucky mm -hmm. on a highway. I think that's the situation. Yeah. So can you kind of... Um, Security needs to be, I, I think, you know, logically, when I was a product of being in school way back in the 80s, 70s and 80s, things were a lot better than they are now. Mm -hmm. um, it, security needs to be ramped up, possibly. Um, there's a lot of things that need to be changed in the schools to kind of prevent this i mean we're not talking really about politics politics today but um i should say donald trump's um running mate said that it's a fact of life you know prepare more but what is your thought on the school shootings um uh, on the situation yeah well it's interesting that you say that you know you're not trying to talk about politics. I don't know that it's really uh, possible to talk about school shootings without being political. So, with your permission, I might, uh, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, let's try. We try to be non-biased here, but okay. No, fair enough. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think uh, it ha it is political. It is political. I, I, because the laws that we have uh, enable this kind of action to happen. And I mean, you really don't see uh, this kind of violence uh, happening in other countries that have uh, stricter or I would call them better gun laws. And so uh, I think that it's a matter of uh, priorities. And, um, you know, I, I guess too, I, I think about it. Um, well, I guess just, just to wrap up that thought, I mean, I think that uh, there are gun laws that would have helped prevent particularly the kind of violence um, th that we saw last week in terms of red flag laws. Uh, you know, Can you explain that? What yeah, exactly sure. That so, is? you know, the idea that um, if, if there is somebody who is at, at risk of, uh, you know, causing harm, uh, with a weapon that other people who um, notice that can, um, n you know, notify police, and then the the guns can be taken out of the home. You know, they can be removed. Uh, um, well, least, uh, I yeah. have a question though. Yeah. Uh, if well, let's say someone's a police officer, mm -hmm. and we have wonderful police officers in Montpelier and, and Barry. Sure. Yeah. Um, aren't they required to? Aren't police officers? 
require if you have a small kid at home to lock it up put it in, put it in a lock box yeah well and uh, that's uh we actually passed a law this last legislative session uh called uh safe storage which meant that um, oh, that's a good thing we'll go ahead yeah yeah for sure so and there's that can mean different things in different places but the way uh that the vermont law works is that um basically if anything bad happens with the gun that um you as the owner would be responsible for it and if if you have not kept it um secure enough and so uh you know it doesn't prescribe exactly how you need to uh secure your guns but it just says that they um need to be secure enough so that you know a a child or uh you know someone couldn't uh couldn't come and steal them or uh take them and then either hurt themselves or somebody else could um, you kind of kind of sure um, this way sit, sit forward okay because the the light is kind of okay, okay. Great. is that better yep that's okay that's wonderful mm-hmm. yeah so um i i believe that is uh in effect now and um yeah and I, I think it's really interesting that you know we're starting to see more parents be held accountable for their minor uh children's actions uh and i i think you know there i think there is some um logical culpability there i mean i'm not uh you know i i don't know about that situ you know these situations particularly but i think theoretically in general you know if you're a, a parent that is um you know leaving guns out uh that that's not, a, not appropriate if there are you know young children around or or even older children that are you know p- having mental health crises you know that that's um it's you know it's a responsibility of the a parent i think to to keep those guns secured now President Obama, back in 2015 or a little bit before he left office, um, he passed something that if you get your Social Security or or if you're disabled, challenge, and you get your Social Security check for mental, let's say you need medication, you get it because of your mental uh health issue because last week we had last week we had on um, Washington County Mental Health Fund but um, if you have a mental health issue you shouldn't be able to have a gun but you know the laws dictate like um, there's a waiting period mm-hmm. if you get what I'm saying here mm-hmm. right yeah. but, but that should be a red flag if you have a mental health issue but we don't know who has a mental health issue and who doesn't mm-hmm. any comment yeah, that is a that's a good question. I mean, sorry if I was no no there. no. That's that's fine. I mean, w- one of the reasons to have a waiting period uh, for purchasing a gun is uh, f- for suicide prevention, and uh, you know we we don't always necessarily know if if somebody has a, a mental health uh, issue or not. You know, from the get go. But it's I, I think even just having that waiting period. Uh, regardless if someone is like diagnosed or not, um, is useful because, um, you know, that, that waiting period allows somebody to, uh, have a little, have a little time to breathe, to reflect, to, to think about, uh, you know, maybe make a different choice about what they want to do. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that waiting period is, I think, useful regardless of like, how official somebody's um, diagnosis might be of depression or, um, you know, some other uh, mental health issue that might uh, put them at, at risk of, of harming themselves. What do you think about the security in schools? Uh, can we change that? I mean, you know, s- security sometimes might scare somebody or too much of, uh, I know New York has to have metal detectors. Mm-hmm. And I know when you go through an airport, you, um, you know, if you have a license, you have to show them that or concealed, the, it's called a concealed license sure. or something like that. What is your take on security? Can we change it you know, without scaring people? I mean, you know. well, without scaring people, probably not, because anytime you make a change <laughs> like that, uh, there's going to be a period of time where something is not normal and is, uh, for that reason alone, it's going to be scary. But uh, it's, it's a good question. I think there are some reasonable... Uh, precautions that 
schools can and I think a lot have um, taken just in terms of like keeping doors locked uh, to the outside. Um, but I, I also like on the one hand, I guess I have mixed feelings about, um, say, like metal detectors. Um, and the Let reason me, mm-hmm. being is uh really because you say i'm sorry you said mixed feelings yes yeah i have mixed feelings about them because on the one hand uh it may help prevent somebody from coming into the school with a gun that feels like a good thing it also feels like uh in a way uh blaming the victim i guess for lack of a better phrase you know it's like there's that that feels like the last line of defense you know that is um the <laughs> we should be, i feel like we should be trying to prevent it uh, pr- uh prevent gun violence from happening in schools well before the gun even gets into the school right there's so many other things that need to be example um, in place well so just for example we, we've talked about secure storage right like should kids be able to have access to guns um, I mean, they're in the first up, place, they're, I'm sorry, they're locking up their phones now. Also, <laughs> yes, that's that's a separate thing. But yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Is that a good thing? Well, we can talk about that. Oh, well, let's, well, let's put a pin in that one because that's there's a lot there for sure. Um, but, you know, I also think about um, like the mental health services that we need to ensure that kids are, are getting. Mm. And, you know, sometimes the violence isn't just, you know, coming from kids. Sometimes it's it's older people, too. So, uh, you know, I, I think about um uh, preventing um, violence from, uh, you know, having better mental health services, but also, you know, these these kinds of laws like the waiting period, like um, like the red flag laws, you know, making sure that people who probably shouldn't have access to guns don't have access to guns, like that that kind of thing. So I feel like there's there are a lot of policies um, that could be in place that would help prevent that sort of thing. And then at the very end of that is like as the you know, the last safeguard is. Um, you know, metal detectors, um, going into schools. Um, you know, I, I guess, and just one further thought on that is like, I think of weapons as a continuum and, uh, we've decided through our laws, you know, that we don't want people to have say nuclear weapons. I think that is a good choice. People should, individuals should not have access to nuclear weapons. Um, but then, uh, you know, going down the scale of destructiveness, like we've drawn the line in a, in a place that feels a little um, arbitrary to me. And it, it seems like we could um, do very well by um, by uh, not allowing uh, individuals to own things like um, uh, air 15s like I, I think that's just not uh yes it might be fun it is also a weapon of war like that is not something that you need to go hunting uh want to fully support yeah. um th- people's right to go um hunting but i don't think that is yeah, um I, I, otherwise you, necessary so when you before you got here yes i i mentioned a comment if you live in a rural area such as vermont and you can't get to a store. I do agree to shoot for food. Mm-hmm. Yes, right? yes, um, sure. Th- sometimes people can only go to the store. Sometimes people can only go to the store. They can only go to the store um, for milk and things sure. like that. And then they have to um, get uh, food. But... Um, yeah, getting an AR-15 for um, for hunting is not good. <laughs> and then, no, it, that's a poor choice. And then the situation with um, the Georgia shooting, his father got him the gift for Christmas. Mm-hmm. That's a definitely poor choice. You it's, know, it's not the choice I would have made. People need to... Uh, think on their choices before they you know yeah um, yeah uh, for sure now now what is your take on um okay so we we touch on security um is there like assault rifles in general Mm -hmm. are there laws against getting an assault rifle so this is not my area of expertise but um my uh understanding is that there is no there's at least nothing in Vermont um, to prevent that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I guess I would um, 
call them uh, automatic weapons or semi-automatic weapons. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay. So why don't we, um, we, you know, why don't we talk about the positive things? Mm -hmm. There are positive things about schools. Oh, days. for sure. So um, much good. <laughs> so, mu so much good. Yeah. Um, I do agree, though, that certain countries. Um, now, one of the things I'm going to mention is this. I feel, my opinion, is that um, th schools are kind of ending earlier. Mm -hmm. 2.15, 2 3 o'clock, mm -hmm. you know. Um, certain countries, example, Israel mm -hmm. um, and other countries, um, school goes a little longer. Mm -hmm. um, your take on that, because you know, parents, people have to work, um, but is, do you have any take on that thing and how things might change? Or? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, as far as I can remember... Uh, even from when I was in school, I don't remember school going past much past three. Uh, and so I don't know that there's been a lot of change in that necessarily, at least my, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I think there's a tension there with, uh, kids having jobs after school and also, uh, kids playing sports. Because uh, a lot of so what's you know, the tension there? I mean, yeah, extracurricular activities is good. Yeah, but right. No, I I agree. But but, but should it drive uh, the curricular time? I think that's a valid question, and that's a a, a decision that is I think historical and uh, uh, is just what we have built our systems around. So uh, you know, I don't think that it's out of the question to consider changing that. Mm -hmm. um, but that would be, a, I think that would be a big deal. I mean, I could picture that uh, working well for uh, for parents of particularly young kids that you know, maybe can't be left at home alone. That or need. maybe kids with spe who uh, have special needs. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Right. That. Um, yeah, they're they've the where the parents have to find uh, someone to watch their kid between. The, at the ending of school and uh, the time when they can come home from work. And uh, as Vermont changed the laws, I don't know if you know th about um, changing situations with like finding, I know finding a babysitter sometimes is hard in Vermont, if I'm not mistaken. I am unaware of any laws that have changed around like, uh, you know, finding a babysitter particularly, though we did pass a... Uh, a bill to support uh, uh, basically early childhood um, education, like like daycares, basically, because there were th there were so many daycares were in crisis. Mm -hmm. um, uh, crisis as far as money, or yeah, as far as money, you know, because they, of the flood, also. Well, I'm uh, not I'm not aware of too many that were affected by the flood, though. I don't want to. <laughs> I'm sure that there were some, but the uh, the idea was that you know parents. Really couldn't af uh, couldn't afford to pay much more in childcare, and e even with what places were bringing in because of uh, you know the the regulations around uh, childcare in Vermont, mm -hmm. it it meant that they couldn't really pay the people you know providing that service very much, and so uh, it there were a lot of places closing. There were a lot of places that were about to close. Um, and so now we have uh, this payroll tax to go to support um, these the child care services. What basically. is that? Can you explain a little bit more about that? Uh, about the payroll tax? Yeah. Yeah. So um, each uh, employer pays uh, some amount to go into a, a, a pot that ends up um, supporting uh, child care basically. And, uh, and that uh, ends, uh, and I, I believe that's used in, in different ways and it's been phased in and uh, apparently it is going to be uh, available to, to parents uh, or, you know, uh, the adults, you know, the, the, uh, the caregivers um, in, in a, uh, in such a, a sliding way that there are no cliffs, right? So the, the benefit goes up and up. Uh, you know, depending um, on how much you you make, um, so 
anyway, it's uh, the intention is to make childcare affordable so that people can, or, uh, adults, you know, the parents can stay in the workforce and uh, and their mm-hmm. their kids can actually have a legitimate uh, spot in a childcare facility um, and hopefully keep these places from well um, when you I'm closing. S- uh, w- when you say legitimate, mm-hmm. exactly, w- th- I'm sure there are, s- are there are scams out there like. Um, oh, I uh, well, I guess. <laughs> thank you. That what I mean is that there are there are some places that are like certified uh, oh, childcare yeah, facilities. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So you know, like if you had a had a nanny uh, or uh, you know a, a family member or somebody who was watching your kid, that's great. You know, no, no nothing against that at all. Um, it's just that they uh, may not have gone through the the certification process and then you know be eligible for uh, support and funding um, from the state. Yeah, uh, so um, I know that there are a lot of scams out there. Also, mm-hmm. uh, you know, who's a child care provider? Who's a school? You know, that kind of thing. Um, is there any? Um, now, because I know everybody has to go through, I know everybody has to go through a rigorous um, license procedure, mm-hmm. right? Anything in terms of that that you might know about or? Oh, in terms of the the process for certification. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, so I actually to become a teacher, oh, to become t- to become a a, a child, you know, um, a child a care facility. Uh, no, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, so I've actually looked through the the requirements for child care facilities, and they're they're you know it's quite a list of of rules or requirements uh, to be able to uh, you know to meet. Uh, these levels of, of certification and I it, it, it to meet some of those you know a place might have to make uh, quite a few investments uh, you know to to be able to meet those those requirements so um, you know it might be things like that the outdoor space is fenced off um, uh, you know things like that and there's a certain like ratio of adults to children and uh, depending on their ages you know that kind of thing and then you know the requirements uh, to become a teacher I mean there gosh there that's like a whole separate process uh, but they're just so at least as far as I know about like being becoming a teacher um, there's a couple ways that uh, people can do that one is to uh, go through a um, uh, a program to become a teacher through uh, a university or a college. And then the other path is what's called the portfolio process, where basically you collect evidence mm-hmm. um, that you have met uh, proficiencies in, in various areas. Um, and uh, and then you present that to a board and they review those portfolios and then a- approve people for licensure um, or, or not. So, uh, yeah, there's a couple different different pathways there so what well okay now positive things in terms of being a teacher you've been a teacher for a long time yes um in terms of teaching in terms of teaching teaching certain topics you know certain topics people might you know students might feel that oh it's boring or or this that that you know um yeah, how long you been a teacher now? Oh gosh, twenty years, long time. <laughs> yeah, long time. Yeah. Um, what made you become a um, physics teacher and a math teacher? Oh gosh. Okay. Well, um, back when I was in college and majoring in physics, um, <clears throat> when I started my college career, I I thought I was gonna go on to uh, get it like a PhD in physics and. Um, you know, just like go the the professor route, uh, and, or do research or something, and uh, by the end of college, I I had done a, had a couple of teaching kinds of experiences. One where I was a tutor mm-hmm. in uh, math and, and in physics, and I was also uh, I, I was a, a a teaching assistant. I actually ran a like an undergraduate lab for physics and I had to like set up experiments and I actually even had to grade papers, um, at the time. And, uh, and I, I loved that. And I actually really loved 
telling people about particularly modern physics because modern physics is just so weird. Uh, and so it, and that, so that's just like delightful to, uh, to talk about and, and, you know, and to think about like the implications about what that says about the world. So, uh, by the time I graduated, I knew that I wanted to be a teacher. And so I went right to, uh, UVM to get my master's in education. And, uh, so that's, that's my, uh, my degree, um, my, my master's in, <clears throat> excuse me, is in education uh, with a, um, concentration in um, secondary science uh, education. So you, so you, so you said secondary. So yeah. basically you taught, did you teach elementary first and then? No. So well, secondary there just, I mean, refers to high school. Mm -hmm. And so I'm. Oh, secondary I'm, is high school. Yeah. 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 Right. Exactly. As opposed to like primary school. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, certified to teach uh, high school science and math. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, in terms of um, you're an avid, you're a soccer player, frisbee, <laughs> all of that stuff. Uh, do you incorporate recreation within your teaching? Is there a way to make it fun <laughs> for kids? Well, I do try to have activities where we get up and move around a fair bit. Um, you know, it's funny you ask that. My my very first year of teaching, I think I did an activity with with frisbees where. Uh, we were we were using them to to talk about vectors um, and vector addition, and uh, I think that was <laughs> there's a reason I don't do that anymore. It was I think it was too uh, complicated uh, for teaching vector as a as a mechanism for teaching what, vectors. Wh okay, what um, are vectors? Oh, uh, vectors are arrows where the length of the arrow indicates um, an amount, and the direction of the arrow indicates the direction. So. Um, yeah, vector addition or arrow addition, uh, it becomes important in like projectile motion. You know, if you're like throwing something, uh, or if something is moving in two dimensions, then um, having being able to add vectors is uh, helpful. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, uh, is it hard to teach certain grades that? I mean, uh, I know high school kids get it. Yeah, well, there's a couple of different philosophies, particularly about physics. I mean, there's there I know of uh, teachers who uh, at their schools, they teach physics first, to, uh, which is to say that they teach physics to uh, freshmen. And of course, if you're going to do that, then you cannot include any calculus. Uh, and sometimes, you know, I think you have to have to be a little bit light on the algebra that's involved as well. Um, but the physics that I teach is um, it's not calculus based, but it does have uh, a requirement that kids have um taken and done um, well in algebra two, uh, particularly because of the, the kinds of graphing that we do. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's how you, I approach it. Well, I, I know you're not a special education teacher, but do you think, here's my line of questioning here, do you think um, certain groups, it might, well, obviously it takes them more time to do uh, certain topics, you oh, know, certain things. For sure. I mean, um, is there a way to really explain algebra to um, a special education population? For sure. I mean, it, like everybody. Um, you know, I mean, this special education population that is a, that is a huge range of. Because uh, I was mainstreamed as a kid. Sure. You know, being from. Yeah. The only thing I had problem was math. No, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> fair <Yeah>. enough. <laughs> I mean, I I think there. That's why I became a journalist. <laughs> it's all good. There's reasons that I don't teach English, for example. <laughs> um, uh, but I I mean, and and everybody, you know, s special education um, needs or not, you know, everybody takes a different amount of time. Uh, to learn things and uh, and different mechanisms or like ways of teaching might work better for different students and like that is perfectly fair and uh, so one of the things that we do um, in physics actually is um, for our first unit is being able to understand motion in a variety of capacities like can we talk about uh, motion using uh, you know, English words, you know, like, can we, um, can we describe it? Uh, can we use vectors? I mean, talking about vectors again, can, um, uh, using, uh, vector diagrams, uh, using, uh, 
uh, position graphs as well as velocity graphs. And then can we also understand it um, algebraically? And all those things are related to each other. And I think, um, you know, being able to, um, you know, understand two or three helps people understand the, the other two. You know what I mean? And so everybody may not uh, gravitate towards, um, you know, understanding things in the same way, but hopefully, um, you know, understanding things from multiple angles or multiple perspectives can help, uh, you know, form a more robust understanding um, of, of what's going on and how to think about and talk about the world. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's that's one of the ways that I approach it. And particularly, like, with algebra, I actually used to uh, teach something called the Foundations of Algebra, uh, which, uh, you know, tried to take... Uh, again, like just different ways of approaching um, algebraic concepts. You know, can we uh, use pictures to uh, to understand uh, what's happening algebraically and under understanding things visually rather than necessarily just with, um, you know, letters and numbers um, like we would see in an equation. And so being able to relate those letters and numbers to something um, visual, like a, a picture of, of what's happening that's is often really helpful. Uh, for students. Mm -hmm. um, now, in terms of funding, okay, I know it's political. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. But in terms of funding schools, I remember when I was in school, kids were using, I, how can I put this? They were using textbooks from 1956. Yes, yes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. And yes. taking it home and um, putting your name in it. They, they're using it for the year and then returning the book. Um, what is your take? I mean, I think kids should have their own books. Why should teachers? There has been cases where teachers... Buy their own supplies. Oh, yes. That's normal in some places. <coughs> yeah. Your take on that question? Oh, gosh. I, I, I'm i sorry. No, no. I mean, I am a huge... Uh, advocate. Of advocate, that. yeah. Proponent of, of schools and school budgets in general. I think there's a lot of work that we can do around the uh, funding... Uh, formula for like where schools get that money from um particularly i would like to be uh i think there's a lot of different ways to tax the rich um i think you know if we can shift um education funding more onto those who can actually afford to pay it then that is what we need to do and uh because you know the average vermonter right now is getting um totally squeezed and and uh, is it because of the well there's taxes everywhere but is it like the food tax, 6%, and then 9%. No, or, this is mostly um, from property taxes. Okay, I, I apologize. No, for you're fine. For, for getting it confused. No, no, you're okay. No worries. Um, yeah, so property taxes go to pay for um, schools as well as uh, municipal um, and I believe even like uh, county operations, I'll have to double check on the county part, but certainly the municipal um, operations. And uh, but at least, you know, in Montpelier, where I'm <laughs> much more familiar, you know, it's like two thirds of, of the um, property taxes are going towards the school rather than towards the municipality. So it's the education portion that's, um, you know, this, the larger part. And um you know, so the, in, within that, there are, uh, the, you know, there's the homestead tax and there's the non-homestead tax. So one of the things I'd, I'm really hoping to do this session uh, is to break out the non-homestead tax into its component parts so that we can tax uh, second homes. So I think if people can afford to have a second home here, then um, that's not a, you know, I like to be able to define second homes as like, you know, not a hunting camp, um, you know, that that's like, uh, you know, all all seasons. Um ready uh but hunting, uh, hunting you, said, you said hunting camp yeah right like a lot of people have hunting camps you know that are uninsulated or you know they're that that's not what uh, you know i have in mind when i say second homes you know i'm thinking of like, and not a yurt or <laughs> a tent <laughs> right right exactly. i've been inside of a yurt <laughs> yeah right it, they, um, they, they're cool but Oh, you they're know. cool. Oh, I agree. Yeah, uh, they're but insulated, <laughs> but we need homes. <laughs> right, right. So I think if somebody can afford to own a second home uh, in Vermont, that uh, that they can and should be 
uh, asked to pay for a, a, a higher percentage of um, education. Like, they, you know, they're not participating necessarily um, in that community in the same way. And so I think they need to be asked to um, contribute more um, financially. So Okay, now, in years past, education was funded um, by... and. Um, we're almost, we're going to end in about 15 minutes. Okay. Um, great. or so. Um, Perfect. Yeah. Sorry. No, no. Uh, thank you. I was just <laughs> wondering when, no how problem. long you were thinking about no going. No problem. Well, I, I, <laughs> well, okay. I was going to go about another 15 minutes. I had like two or three more questions. Okay. Great. But, um, the situation is education used to be paid or, or money was also funded by the lottery system. Sometimes a percentage would go from the sale of mm -hmm. that. I know New York does that and yeah. other states. Yeah. Does Vermont? I think so. That's my understanding. Yeah. Yeah. But my qu my question is, if all this money is supposed to be coming in, why do teachers have to buy their own supplies? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I just no, I keep bringing that up. That's, that's fair. No, to be fair, I um, yeah, I well, I, I do know that there are teachers in Vermont who buy their own supplies, and um, or for for some things, uh, but I, 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 my understanding is that they, it can be worse in in other states. Um, you know, in terms of teachers, when nobody has a budget, right? Or teachers right. Don't have a budget. Yeah, um, and you know. If, our, I think part of the the issue here is that our um, we have a lot of uh, very s some of them are very some school districts are very small and that that poses a, a problem and so there ends up being a, a lot of spending um, you know per pupil in some in some places mm -hmm. um, you know Barry particularly um, the the amount of increase there's actually a vote coming up on uh, gosh. It is a week from today. Yes. Um, uh, and, you know, Barry's increase is quite small relative to the, the state average. But anyways, um, the uh, I, I think, you know, the, like as every school has has a budget and, you know, I can speak to at least how Montpelier works in terms of like like the science department, the math department have their own uh, their and own I budget. I apologize for jump, jumping around. So. Oh, sure. Yes. Go ahead. Oh, <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. Jump. Jumping around as far as like questions. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I guess you know, coming back to your your uh, your question about like you know how is it that people are having to spend their own money? You know, like there are things that are designated in budgets. You know, like buying supplies and um, or equipment or um, you know subscriptions or whatever. Um, and and if those if that amount of money turns out to not be enough, um, then yeah, a teacher might go um, you know buy their own. Um, supplies, for example, mm -hmm. um, and so I, you know, I think if uh, if we're going to try to prevent that, then we need to have um, robust school budgets that are um, that are appropriate for the um, a num number of students that that are there. Um, I mean, there's a lot of issues uh, around schools, like you know, deferred maintenance and uh, construction issues, and uh, gosh, like healthcare costs. Like there are a lot of um, there are a lot of, uh, you know, issues that uh, school budgets are facing right now, and uh, I like think like what before we end, what what exactly is going on? Yeah, well, so because uh, there are a lot of school dis districts this year that saw um, increased uh, budgets, and but there are many different drivers uh, for for that increase, and. Uh, and so I, I think that the well, I, it is worth mentioning that that there is a commission on the future of education whose job it is to is to over the next uh, two basically year and a half is to come up with what some solutions are, are going to be for that. And, you know, it could be everything from, you know, having a. Uh, an indexed cap on the amount of uh, increase that a, a school budget could have. It could be transitioning to um, an income-based uh, education tax and move away from property taxes entirely. Um, it could be a, it could be a lot of different things. It could be you know how what is the right size for each school and what is the what is the model. 
um, for the state. So no, yeah. In terms of that, and this is the last cu- question because I know you have to go. <laughs> um, no, it's fine. Um, so here's the in New York, for example. Um, this you know students or the influx of students, um, and they didn't they don't have enough room for even a school, and what New York is doing or has done in the past with the New York City Education Department, they've put um, students in school buses and they're teaching them in, in trailers and school buses because either the, the construction of the school is falling apart, you know, infrastructure kind yes. of thing. Yes, yes. Um, do we have enough um, teachers? Two, two things within this. Do we have enough teachers to... Um, teach large amounts of students and and do we have if i'm saying it wrong or or, and do we have uh enough room because i know during the pandemic there was zoom classes and and all of that and i know covid is still going on in some parts but um what is your take on the influx is there an influx of teachers or influx of students or both uh uh, well, I would say n- neither. <laughs> and the reason uh, is because we have the statewide uh, student enrollment is declining. Um, and Declining? That means that they don't want to be in school? No, no. Like th- there's, just few, there's just fewer kids. Uh, okay. Just like the number of, of kids in Vermont is, um, is going down. And, you know, different uh, districts within Vermont uh, may be experiencing something different than that. Uh, but my understanding is that on the whole... Um, the student enrollment is is declining, and in addition, um, we have a shortage of teachers. And I actually, I mean, I was talking with uh, a couple of superintendents who said that um, you know they're they're trying to hire more teachers to fill positions, but they're actually having a hard time doing that. And they've actually had uh, situations where teachers have. Um, that, you know, gotten hired, are excited to come here, r- you know, ready to start, uh, but then they look for a house to buy and they can't find anything that oh, wow. suits their needs. And so they end up having to decline the position because they literally cannot find a place to live. Um, because of there's a lack of housing. Because of the lack of housing. And, I mean, the lack of housing is affecting uh, almost every... And people are having to live in yurts or saying, <laughs> no, no. I, As we were saying, talking I, about yurts, I, I yeah, know, not a solution. I, I know for a lot of people. I know it's not funny because the homeless population situation is not funny. Oh no, at yeah. all. And people are living in tents. But if you don't have a place to live, you can't take your job. Yes. Yeah. Well, or it's really hard um, to to uh you know to keep a job especially if you're you know you don't have a, a home base mm-hmm. now um, last thing what's the future of education uh, what do you think the future of education is especially with um you know people with becoming teachers and and funding uh, well at least in terms of funding i think that there are there has to be some big shifts coming in terms of funding um in in a way that um, alleviates the financial pressure on the average um, working and middle class Vermonter, um, and I and I think we need to reevaluate uh, how our society views uh, wealth and be able to uh, you know ask the people who are uh, making a lot of money to pay uh, for schools, but also for um, you know other uh, services that that government provides. So. Um, I, I think that's that's got to be where where we go in terms of um, education funding, um, and you know, in in general, though, I mean, Vermont's got a good education system. Sometimes people say like, "Ah, oh, our test scores aren't great." We're we're doing fine. We're okay. Like nationally speaking, um, we're doing all right. And better, um, better than a large city, or uh, in terms of like state rankings, um, I think we we're. I, I forget where we are, but the last time I looked, it was um, we were definitely like in the top quarter. So, mm-hmm. um, so th- yeah, and I, I think uh, you know, we we need to continue to um, think about 
how we provide the best education possible for our kids and uh, and prioritize, uh, or at least keep that in the center of our, our thinking and conversations about whatever that future looks like. Well, I would like to thank you so much for joining me on Able to Learn Air Live. <clears throat> and um, please come back again. Absolutely, Larry. And, and we have... And and we de- you know we had fun. Um, we should you know um, we you know talk about more education stuff because it's you know very important. But thank you so much. I know you have to get out of here uh, 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 and um, say hi to the family. And um, coming up next week, um, so, uh, coming up next week, we have on the phone. Uh, David Wecker, who is a social worker in Israel, talking uh, about marriage and people with special needs. Thank you for joining me on Able to End On Air Live, and see you next time.